If you have any interest in vintage gaming, you've surely noticed how prices in the used game market have skyrocketed to a stupid degree over the last year. For newcomers, or people who just want a quick hit of nostalgia, the price of entry can be scary and straight up annoying. It's no wonder that interest in flashcards and ODEs, which make it possible to play game ROMs or disk image files off an SD card on real console hardware, are becoming increasingly more appealing to just about anyone involved in the hobby. These indispensable devices provide a convenient and fairly authentic way of exploring a system's library. After releasing the Mega SD, a flashcard for the Sega Genesis and Mega Drive, which had Sega CD-ROM support, and the Mode, an optical drive emulator for the Saturn, Dreamcast, and PlayStation 1, Terra Onion returns to update one of their most popular devices, the Super SD System 3 for the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16. This is the Super HD System 3 Pro, and let's see if it's worth upgrading. When the Super SD System 3 was first announced back in 2018, the excitement surrounding it was palpable. Here is a device that connects to the back of your PC Engine, TurboGrafx-16, or Super Graphics that lets you load just about any game for the system without needing a CD-ROM add-on, all while passing through RGB video output via a Genesis 2-style DIN. Outside of Super Graphics game support, which was only still possible if you're connected to a Super Graphics console, this was possibly the most robust flashcard style device that had come along yet, and it was a real dream come true for fans and newcomers alike. Unfortunately, the first couple of revisions were hindered by various technical issues related to the video output specifically. Some of these flaws were fixed via firmware updates, while the more egregious problems needed full-on hardware modifications. After a final revision that incorporated these fixes at a base hardware level, Terra Onion then moved on to other projects, the Mega SD, and the Mode, multi-optical disc emulator. Both are robust devices in their own right, but they also don't need to bother with video output. In fall of 2020, the Super SD System 3 received a firmware update that streamlined the menu interface to align with the Mega SD and Mode. This was a pleasant surprise, since the old menu setup was starting to look slightly antiquated. Everyone was curious what Terra Onion's next device was going to be, and when they began to tease an announcement in spring of 2021, speculation went into overdrive. I don't think anyone expected the Super HD System 3 Pro, an updated version of the Super SD System 3 that features an enhanced FPGA, Super Graphics support for all consoles, and HDMI output. All this comes at a price of around 320 US dollars, making it nearly $100 more than the Super SD System 3, which received a price drop a while back. As the Super HD Pro began to reach consumers' hands in July of 2021, Terra Onion asked if I wanted to take a look and see if it was worth the upgrade. So, they sent over a review unit, and here we are. From a purely aesthetic point of view, the major differences between the original and the new device is the blue-colored plastic and the AV port plate which now has openings for an HDMI cable, a micro USB for developers, and a physical reset button, in addition to the previous Genesis 2-style DIN for analog video output. The micro SD slot is still tricky to access, requiring long fingernails or a pair of tweezers to get the card in and out. The device slides onto the back of the console, connecting to the pinouts on the back. As before, it's tough to get it just right on a TurboGrafx-16 console, so you might need to loosen the screws a bit to get it on. But this might also cause things to not line up perfectly, and some pins might get bent. Because of this, and it's something that I didn't realize about the original Super SD3, is that it's not officially supported. Yeah, it'll work identically once connected, so just remember to be careful when putting it on there, okay? The real differences are under the hood, thanks to a more powerful FPGA, as well as experience built up during the development of the Mega SD and Mode, the team at Terra Onion were able to completely rethink and evolve their previous approach for this new version. Once you boot up the system, you're met with a newly designed menu that's about as straightforward as these things can be. Different color themes can be used to change the window dressing to match your console of choice, while a new cover art browser can be activated with the help of a database file if you want a more complete look. It does get a slight resolution bump when using the built-in HDMI output, though. 
Game ROM and disk images are stored on an XFAT or FAT32 formatted micro SD card in whatever directory hierarchy works for you. CD-ROM games do need all of their relevant files placed within their own folder on a per game basis though. That folder name is what the menu will see as the game. So look, this is an update to the Super SD System 3, a device which I covered pretty handily back in 2018. As much as I'd prefer to only spend my time looking at the newer features, let's do a quick overview of the essential features of the Super HD System 3 Pro. First off, it's important to point out the way that Terra Onion handles firmware updates has not been changed. New firmware updates are downloadable from a portal on their website and requires you to register your device's serial number to an account, and those firmware updates are tied directly to that serial number. Some people might not care about this process, but others could understandably have an aversion to this method of dealing with updates. Hue cards, or turbo chips if you prefer, work just as good as they did before. This is a given since you're using the original console's hardware to play them. On the other hand, CD-ROM games rely on the FPGA, which is emulating the Super CD-ROM hardware. As a result, the potential for incompatibilities and glitches is much greater. If you do run into issues, you might just need to toggle the Seek Time Emulation setting in the menu so that the hardware reads the data as if it was a 1x CD-ROM drive. If all else fails, give the Alternate CD-ROM Program a try, which emulates a different set of CD-ROM hardware. This fixed an issue I ran into where the Adams Family would hang after the intro, preventing you from being able to play this incredibly well-made game. But sometimes, a game is just busted, and there's no way to get it working perfectly right now, such as with Sherlock Holmes Volume 2's FMV audio being out of sync, which was also a problem on the original SD system. You see it in the paper every day. But thankfully, we have the London Times to keep us informed of all these troubling activities with an unbiased eye. But in some cases, it's even possible that an incompatibility or glitch could simply stem from certain game and BIOS combinations. An update to the in-game trigger, where you can jump back to the Super HD menu when you hold down select and run for several seconds, has supposedly been made to work better. Although, I never really had much of an issue with it before. If you do run into circumstances where this doesn't work at all, a new physical button on the back of the Super HD will reset the game or return to the menu. As someone who cares way too much about their save files, the per-game backup RAM is one of my favorite features of the Super SD System 3 and, by proxy, the Super HD System 3. Keeping this setting activated will create an empty pool of backup RAM for each game that supports save files, so space concerns will never become a major issue. Not to mention that it's easy to backup and share your saves for future generations. The inclusion of Super Graphics game support is a top-tier feature and something that people wish that the Super SD System 3 could do when it was originally released. The high price of buying Super Graphics hardware, combined with its minuscule library of exclusive games, generally isn't worth the price of entry for most. Being able to play through these games on a PC Engine or TurboGrafx-16 is a big win for those who don't want to shell out for the industrial-looking piece of hardware. But what about those of you who already have a Super Graphics system? like me. Well, here's where we run into a slight conundrum. You see, using the Super HD System 3 on a Super Graphics console might break compatibility with Super Graphics games. Weird, right? This wasn't an issue on the Super SD System 3, so what's the deal? Most of the Super Graphics extra power comes from a second visual display controller, or VDC, which handles additional sprites and background layers. The Super SD System 3 outputs the analog video that was passed to it from the system, and in the case of a Super Graphics, both original hardware VDCs would generate the graphics in tandem and send it out via the analog pins. The spark plug and engine block AV work the same way. The Super HD System 3 does things a bit differently though, and this is important. All PC Engine consoles with the external port have a number of pins that are tied to a digital video signal. The Super HD System 3 reconstructs the video from these digital pin outs to give us exceptional looking video over either analog or HDMI. But the problem with the Super Graphics is that the second VDC doesn't have corresponding digital pins, which means that the Super HD System 3 doesn't have all the information to work with. So instead, it emulates the second VDC on the FPGA. And this is how these games are able to be played on a regular old PC engine. But on a Super Graphics system, it causes major graphical glitches. Now, sure, you can sidestep the issue by flipping the PC Engine mode compatibility switch on the Super Graphics system, 
but then you're not even using the system's additional hardware. So what's even the point? Even then, while super graphics games run fairly well, they're certainly not flawless. Take 1941 for example. Look how the destructible portions of the cliff on stage 2 are slightly separated on the Super HD while it's totally fine on the Super SD. I guess what I'm trying to say is, if you're a super graphics owner, I think that you'll find that the Super SD System 3 offers a much more authentic experience. One of the touted features of the more powerful FPGA is the ability to run different cores on it. Think something like the Mister, where the FPGA emulates different consoles. As it stands right now, an NES core has been teased, but neither that or any other cores are available, so I can't really comment on this feature. But I can make a note that the PC Engine conversions of some NES games, like Mega Man 2, do run just fine on the Super HD system. But let's jump back for a minute. What was all that about digital pinouts? Well, that's sort of a big thing with the Super HD System 3 Pro. So let's look at the different audio and video options, as well as seeing what that HDMI output is all about. The Super HD system outputs analog composite, RGB, and component video via a Genesis 2 style DIN plug, while the HDMI output offers 640x480, 480p, or 720p. While the Super HD System 3 is tapping the digital pins to rebuild the video image, this isn't the same as how, say, the PS1 or N64 digital mods work. So just be sure to level your expectations. If HDMI output is the main hook for you, it looks really great, if you don't mind being limited to 720p. Of the three resolutions supported over HDMI, 720p is likely the one that generates the most interest, not just because it's the highest, but also because when combined with the sharp filtering option, you get an integer scale of all the system's different resolutions evenly within the frame. With 640x480 and 480p, you might run into some shimmer if a game's resolution can't be evenly scaled within the frame. If you feel that a game looks too wide when integer scaled in 720p, try out the smooth scaling mode, which also corrects the aspect ratio since the slightly blurred image will also hide the shimmer. The requisite scanline modes do a good job of approximating the overall feel of a CRT, but in a time when various mods and upscaling devices are going absolutely buck wild with scanline and overlay options, there's just not a lot to be excited about here. Like most older consoles, the PC Engine doesn't output frames exactly to the NTSC spec, so buffered video is required to ensure greater screen compatibility. This buffered mode gives us around one frame of lag across the main trio of HDMI resolutions. However, there is an unbuffered, nearly zero lag 480p mode, but all the displays I tried it on haven't liked this mode at all and haven't worked. The analog video output quality seems to be a minor step up from the Super SD system, which I felt looked really good by the final revision of that hardware anyway. Depending on what type of cable you're using with the analog connection, you want to adjust the analog brightness setting. Normal brightness is fine for RGB, but if you got some of them HD retrovision cables, set this to medium and turn the brightness switch off. Speaking of cables, the analog video seems to generate a weird ghosting effect that's reminiscent of what happens with the C11 capacitor on the Super NES Junior systems. The degree to which anyone will ever notice this will vary, and it only became apparent to me when walking past the clouds at the end of the intro stage in Bonk's Revenge. In testing various scenarios, this seems to be always present when using an RGB cable, but can be eliminated with using the HD retrovision cables and adjusting the low-pass filter on your upscaler of choice. On a CRT, it's virtually invisible. Depending on the equipment you already have integrated into your gaming setup, using the analog signal with an external scaler like the OSSC or RetroTINK 5X gives you greater control of the image without limiting you to 720p. But then, you might have to deal with the ghosting, Making the situation more complex is that the Super SD system doesn't seem to exhibit any sort of ghosting artifacts no matter what cable you use, and neither do any of the other popular analog options, such as the spark plug and the engine block AV. So I suppose it could be argued that if you're an analog purist, the Super SD system might be the superior choice to get your PC Engine ODE fix. The biggest letdown for me is that the Super HD cannot output video over analog and HDMI simultaneously. I'm sure there's numerous reasons this wasn't possible, 
but this would have gone a long way to qualifying the device as an essential upgrade. So if you're looking to play on a CRT while recording or live streaming gameplay in HD via HDMI, then I'm afraid you're going to have to look to other methods. If you ask me, perhaps the most exciting and interesting feature of the Super HD System 3 is the use of different color tables, or palettes. Up until recently, all the different PC Engine video mods, emulators, and FPGA implementations have used linearly mapped RGB color values. For the most part, this looks totally fine, but when compared side by side with the PC Engine's composite video in certain games, suddenly it becomes clear that something is amiss. The example everyone likes to cite is a battle scene from Startling Odyssey 2, where one of the gradients in the sky seems to be completely missing in RGB. Thanks to the hard work, research, and testing by a team of dedicated PC Engine fans, a composite palette has been developed that adjusts certain color values to bring it more in line with composite video. Until now, this palette has only been officially implemented in the Mr. FPGA's Turbo Duo Core. But thanks to the Super HD System 3's palette feature, you can now load it on real hardware. Just drop the .pal file into the palettes folder inside of the sys folder on the SD card. Go to the color table and video options and it will show up there. Of course, if you prefer the linear RGB palette, just stick with the default setting. And finally, we haven't really touched on the audio side of things yet. The original Super SD System 3 didn't recreate totally accurate audio, but to my ear, I didn't think it was all that bad. But now, thanks to MD Fourier, an incredible tool for analyzing console sound, Tear Onion could dial in the Super HD3's audio to skew closer to a real console. There's a significant difference in audio levels between HDMI and analog output, with no room for adjustment. I've been told that boosting the audio levels on the analog side would cause distortion in the audio. That's really unfortunate. But how close did they get to real hardware through the use of MD Fourier? Here, take a listen and judge for yourself. So where does this leave us with the Super HD System 3 Pro? Well, it's definitely not a clear-cut decision. Although I absolutely applaud Terra Onion for having the forethought to include the composite color palette, as well as using MD Fourier to adjust the audio, I'm not sure if this upgrade was necessary right now. Of course, the creation of this new version could have to do with any number of circumstances, such as the worldwide chip shortage that's going on right now. The landscape of the vintage gaming scene is in a constant flux right now. So the arrival of the Super HD System 3 Pro is a prime example of how hard it can be to iterate upon an already fully featured device. For those who have never bought the Super SC System 3, this is a great place to jump in. But it's tough to justify an upgrade if you still have the original version. Fact is, there's valid reasons to want either version in your gaming setup. So as much as I hate to say it, you're just going to have to decide what's right for your particular situation.